Thank you, Pastor McMurtry. Thank you, church. Turn to Matthew chapter 23. Very thankful and appreciative to be here for the opportunity. Again, especially given I'm Canadian, it's an extra measure of grace your pastor gave me. So, <clears throat> What I want to talk about quickly this morning is uh, real Christianity. Real Christianity. I was thinking to myself, uh, in reflection of myself, really, um, you know, what really makes the Lord angry? What, what makes him down on people? What makes him upset with people? And, you know, I thought about buying and selling in the church and, and uh, that sort of thing. But uh, ultimately, we have a picture in Matthew chapter 23 of the Lord really getting angry. <laughs> and I just want to read through that a little bit and just talk about a few things that I notice from that passage. Matthew chapter 23, I'm going to begin in verse 1. It says, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. And that's the key there. They say and do not. They're, they're all talk. They're no walk. Everything that they talk about doing and exhort people to do and say that people ought to do, mainly law-focused, they're not doing those things themselves. They're, 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 they're hypocrites. And as we read through, we're going to see how Jesus reacts to people in this case. It says in verse 4, For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garment and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men rabbi, rabbi. These great and glorious terms, they just love to soak those things up. They love to be seen of men and all their works they do for to be seen of men. The Bible here is clear. We were just out soul winning uh, yesterday and I, I, we knocked on a door, my wife and son and I, and just as the door is opening, my wife's like, what in the world is that thing? And I knock on the door, and this man comes out with his long, flowing hair all tied up. And I say, sir, if you were to die today, are you certain you're going to heaven? And he says, yeah, I'm good. I'm a Jew. See that? <laughs> he just simply pointed to this thing. He's like, you know what that is? And I looked again, and I saw this little three-pointed star thing there. And I'm like, okay, I know what that is. And then I say, but then... Then what of Jesus? He came and he fulfilled Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all these prophecies about the coming Messiah and fulfillment of what you say you believe, right? He admits, I, I believe a different God. And then he says, he says, I understand all that, but I'm good. I'm a Jew. It's just like this, this statement where they say they make broad their phylacteries. They, they enlarge the borders of their garments. It's all about being seen of men with these folks. And, and to him, he's going to stand before God and the Lord's going to say, why should I let you into my heaven? And he's going to say, I had that little thing on my door. I'm a Jew. I'm good, right? That's, it, that's not going to grant anyone access to the kingdom. That's going to say, depart from me, you works of iniquity. I never knew you, right? And so we pleaded with him for like two seconds, and we saw it was going nowhere and walked away, right? <laughs> All their works they do for to be seen of men. They love to be called rabbi, rabbi. And verse 8 continues and says, But be ye not called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ. And all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. There's a key that they're missing is that it's the humble servant servant of Christ, the humble servant of God that gets exalted. And yet the whole modus operandi of these Pharisees is that they just want to be seen. They want to be exalted. They want to be lifted up. They do their works just so men would stand in awe at how great and holy and wonderful they are. It continues on and Jesus is going to start dealing with them through the preaching of God's word specifically and personally. Let's read through it. Verse 13. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. 
Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing, but whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold, and who Whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing, but whosoever shall sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift. Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it and all and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God, and by him that sitteth thereon. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not left the under other undone. Ye blind guides, which strain at a gnat, and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but they are within full of dead men's bones and of uncleanness." all uncleanness. Even so ye do also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Like the Lord is not even giving a measure of grace unto these. Why? Because they are full of themselves. Because they are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. They are white and beautiful and wonderful on the outside to men that look upon, but God sees their hearts and know that it is dead men's bones and all uncleanness in, within them. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first the outside, or the inside of the cup, that the outside may be cleansed also. And this is how God wants to work with people. He wants to work in your heart. He wants to work and clean the things that are not seen by men. The thing about our sins is they're, they're often beheld on others. People can look at you and they can understand that, hey, this person smokes cigarettes and this person goes to the bar and this person does that. But quite often that person in their heart is not as wicked as the person that shows up to church with a nice suit on week in, week out, three to thrive, and yet he is full of iniquity, full of hypocrisy, full of the sins that no one can see. And this is the thing that I believe God hates most of all because it's the thing that you find the Lord Jesus Christ yelling and screaming and hollering and really pressing the issue on more than anything else, and that is religious hypocrisy, religious hypocrisy. See, the thing about our life is that we can often be religious phonies, can we not? Each one of us has that tendency to just kind of go through the motions religiously and, and just kind of do the things that we think appear good to others that are looking upon us. So we are often whited sepulchers, looking good, looking sharp, doing the religious ritual and rigmarole and all of the things that you should do to appear righteous to others. But quite often it's when we go home and things aren't seen. And, and quite often it's the things in the meditations of our heart that are the things that actually mark us as a believer. It's our heart that God sees, and it's our heart that's going to eventually, no matter how much you suppress it and put a nice tie on it, it's going to bubble up and be seen by all. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Your sins will be revealed to others, no matter how hard you try to suppress that hypocrisy. 
We're really good at this. We read, we study, we know. Myself, when I was first saved, I spent that first year just studying the scriptures, just reading through the Bible, thinking that the end was near because I came out of that truth movement. I needed time to finish that Bible, and I didn't think I was going to do it. The Lord answered my prayer as I wouldn't have expected, where I was in a car accident and off work for a whole year. Praise the Lord. Now I've got a whiplash, and I'm trying to read the Bible while keeping everything straight and healing, right? But I read through the Bible five times in that first year as being a believer. It was, I was shocked and awed when I found out that that is completely abnormal. <laughs> and so in my Christian life, doing that on my own, do you know what happened to me? I became one of these guys. I knew lots of Bible. I knew lots of scriptures. I had great understanding, but I was a religious phony by and large. I didn't go to church. I thought I knew better than everybody else. I was full of myself, and this was a big problem in my early Christianity. But this is also something that we can all become susceptible of. There's great resources out there on the internet. There's great resources from your pastor. There's great resources available where we can, as believers, get full of knowledge and then end up studying to show our ourselves approved unto all those people around us when we lift up our heads and put our nose down upon them and say well I know this and such and such and I can connect all these doctrines and I know everything about the word of God but you become a religious hypocrite if you're not actually fulfilling the works that are expected of you when God preaches these things to you study to show yourself approved unto God not unto Facebook not unto your neighbors not unto your co-workers you're to be approved unto God a workman that needeth not be ashamed a workman, not a, not a smarty pants, not a know-it-all. You're to be a workman that needeth not be ashamed. When the word enters in, that changes you and moves you to do greater things that benefit others. Knowledge doesn't make you a good Christian. Knowing facts doesn't make you a good Christian. You can know the Bible front to back, measure the whole thing, and, or memorize the whole thing, and still end up being rotten on the inside if you don't let that word enter in and actually change you and do something. This is how you become a religious hypocrite. You know, some of these Pharisees had the entirety of the Old Testament committed to memory. They could just rhyme this thing off. They knew every jot and every tittle in their memory. It was concealed in their hearts, and yet it didn't change them. They proved themselves to be unrighteous, wicked hypocrites, full of all uncleanness. So we can study, we can know, and we can fill ourselves up with reading and head knowledge and get nowhere in our walk. Furthermore, we can also do this, and I've seen this many times, and this has been in my heart many times as well. You can go and do and labor and do all of those things 100% in the flesh. Do you know that? Do you know that you can do Christian duties, Christian works, you can go soul winning, you can read your Bible, you can pray, you can fast, you can tithe, you can do all that completely in the power of your own flesh. Some people do this quite often. Some people really like to get behind some new movement. They like, they like to reform themselves. They like to, they like to make a change and make a difference. You know, uh, you, your pastor's been putting up these people that are changing all of the time, like Bill Schneblin, for example, right? He's always something new. This is a guy that completely in the power of his own flesh is becoming a Satanist, and then suddenly he's going to be a, a Baptist, and then suddenly he's going to be a full-blown Jew, and he's just doing all of these things completely in the power of the flesh because that man doesn't have the spirit of God. He doesn't preach or believe the right gospel. He's doing those things for to be seen of men and he's doing it completely in the power of his own flesh. We get them in Toronto. You guys might have them here as well. Men that do good works in the name of Christ and yet they're doing it completely in the power and of their own will and of their own fleshly mind. <clears throat> the flesh profiteth nothing, the Bible says, the spirit that giveth life. That flesh will profit you nothing. You do Christian duties, you do good works in your flesh, it will profit you nothing in the long run. Keep that in mind as we walk this walk. We can study, we can read, we can know tons, and it will not get us anywhere further in the kingdom of God. We can work and labor and do works in the power of our own flesh, and it will not get us anywhere further in the kingdom of God. In fact, both of those things will put us in the Matthew chapter 23 category, where we're scribes, we're Pharisees, we're hypocrites, we're full of all uncleanness, and yet we appear righteous on the outside. The flesh profiteth you nothing. 
It does not bring you favor with God. It does not bring glory to God. It is the same rotten, stinking flesh that you were born with. When you get born again, a new man enters in you. But hey, you got that same rotten, stinking flesh carrying your way through the rest of your life until it eventually drops dead. You got to take control of that thing. You got to put that thing down. You got to kill that thing every single day so that you can walk in the spirit. See, sometimes in our, our days, in our lives, we, we fight so hard to gain a whole world of condolences, of accolades, of congratulations, and we lose the heart and the soul of the very faith that we believe and we profess to believe. The, the faith is a, is a walk before a God that is, that is keeping you right by his word. The, the faith walk is something that changes a man at the foundations of it all and allows for him to be moved of the spirit unto good works, not conjuring up of our own fleshly desires, something that appears to be good. Christianity should change me. It should also change the people that are in my life by the effects that I have. Does not the Bible teach that we are salt and light of the earth? We're supposed to go around and preserve and bring clarity to things that are around us. We're to, we're to be someone that is different and something that is different. Why do we end up with this problem? Because we walk often with the wrong motive. We, we have the wrong motivation and we ultimately are following the wrong master. Motive, when it's in error, is because we're doing right just because we want something to have in return for it. Our motive should be that we do right because it's right to do right. We should do right simply because that's what God expects and because that's what we know is that good and right thing to do. Not to satisfy and benefit my own self. I need to be in the place where my motive is to just simply do right because it is right. My motivation shouldn't be so that others would see, so that others would rejoice and give me a round of applause when I, do, when I give to charities or when I go soul winning, when I, when I see someone, a, you know, a walking old lady across the road, whatever it is. I shouldn't be expecting condolences and, and people to uh, motivate me, encourage me, like I have cheerleaders around me just celebrating my every act. My motivation should be to benefit others, not to benefit and gratify myself. The master, the wrong master. When do we have the wrong master? Well, that's when we let sin, we let self, and we let Satan lead us. And Christians can still do that. We can be oppressed, and we can be motivated by the works of the devil. He can motivate us to do wrong. We'll never be possessed by a devil, but he can definitely come into our lives, set up scenarios, set up circumstances. You know, for, for young men, have a, have a pretty young lady walk by. For the ladies, have some expensive thing to covet. Who knows what it is? But the reality is, is that Satan can enter in our lives and hinder us. And if we let him be the master, he's happy to do it, isn't he? He's happy to take the reins of your life. Self, what's worse? I mean, sometimes I think myself, it affects me and has more problem, is more problematic in my life than Satan. We like to blame stuff on Satan, but isn't our flesh and our sinful flesh, it's with us all the time. Yeah, I think the devil's got better things to do than to come into my room and my house and make sure that I'm messing things up with God. I think he's got bigger fish to fry, maybe in Washington or, or, or with true Trudeau up there in Canada, right? He's, he's, got, he's got bigger fish to fry than to come. Sure, he's got minions and hordes of these devils that'll come around and they'll mess with my life. But man, myself does not leave me. That's what Paul said. He's like, I die daily. He's like, oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Right? Well, I thank the Lord that he has. And if I by faith accept that and believe that, then Christ becomes the right master. I no longer serve sin. I no longer serve self. I no longer serve Satan because I've given Christ the proper reign in my life. No one needs to be your master. And we saw that even in the passage of scripture that we read. Call no man your master, for one is your master, even your father, which is in heaven. That's the appropriate response in the Christian's life. Have the right motive, the right motivation, and the right master. So what is real Christianity. I'm going to have to be quick here. John chapter 13. John chapter 13. What is real Christianity? What does it entail? Well, first of all, a love for God's people. John chapter 13. And look in verse 15. John 13 and verse 15. For I have given you an example that you should do even as I have done to you. Sorry, verse 34. But that's a good verse as well. John chapter 13 and verse 34. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> a new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one for another. 
Verse 15, for I have given you an example that you should do even as I have done to you. And that's exactly what Christ did. He set forth that example, even as I have loved you. Look to the example of Christ. So love you your brethren. That's real Christianity. That's not seeking self. That's not being self-motivated. That's not looking for everyone in here to applause and, and celebrate all of the good and wonderful works that you're doing. No, you are loving one another. And you know what love does? Love sets self second. Maybe even third, how about Christ? How about others? How about yourself last of all? Love covers up the multitude of sins because love is an expression of complete selflessness. And often our sins are just simply a manifestation of our own self gratification, our own want for something greater for ourselves. Love God's people and have no love for the world. You can turn to 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2. The Pharisees, the scribes, the hypocrites, they say, I love God. They say, I love God's people. But we know that their heart was far from him. In 1 John chapter 2 and in verse 15, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Verse 16, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. This world's going to end. This world's going to pass away. Your brothers and sisters in Christ will be with you forever even once all that happens. So why are we so entangled with the things of this world? The lust that it has to offer. The entanglements. The, the trap that is here in this world when we can have love extended not to that junk but to our brothers and sisters that we will spend eternity with. We'll be able to love them forever. They'll love us back forever in that perfect unity once we see heaven, once we see Christ. That's a wonderful joy. That's something promised in heaven and one of those wonderful things that you can enjoy here on this earth. Love one for another. That's real Christianity. That's something that is completely opposite of the Pharisees because they wanted to be seen of men and men are of this world, are they not? We are living spirits, right? We are quickened in the spirit. Why do you want to get Brother Josh's rotten, stinking flesh on your side to give you a celebratory clap? You want nothing to do with that old, dead, dirty, rotten man. You want his spirit. You want fellowship. You want something that is beyond what is in this world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in this world. We need to be spiritually focused in that aspect. If you would, you can just turn over to 1 John chapter 2. We're still there. And in verse 20, it says, But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. The next thing about real Christianity is that there is an unction and power of the Spirit. If you were to look down in verse 27, it says, But the anointing, anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now little children abide in him. That unction, that spirit, that power that God gives you on high, do you know what that does? That makes us teachable. As Christians, we need to love God's people. We also need to have that teachable spirit, do we not? We need to be able to be corrected and rebuked when God deems that necessary. Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, and in verse 15, Philippians chapter 3, and in verse 15, it says, Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, that, and if anything ye, or, and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. So be thus minded. What mind is that? That mind is Christ, if you read the whole context. We need to be thus minded, and if you have that unction, if you have that teachable spirit as a believer, then if there is any other thing, any other mind in you, when God reveals it unto you, do you know what you do? You change it. You reform it. You get that thing right. Perfect means that you are a complete and assembled believer. And as many as would be perfect and well-rounded, you will have that mind which receives what is revealed to you by the Spirit because you are Spirit-led. Look across in chapter 2 and in verse... Three, chapter 2 and verse 3, it says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. See that selflessness there? 
Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others, having more importance to the other person's things. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but, watch this, made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. You know that's teaching there? That's teaching that Christ highly exalted, Christ lifted up, Christ, Christ the, 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 the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the only one worthy of having accolades, the only one worthy of being separ- uh, celebrated, was the one that took upon himself the form of a servant, became humble and low and meek in order that he would eventually be exalted. But he did that for a purpose, and the purpose was revealed, an example He was an example to us that we should follow after. So the Christian loves one another. The Christian is also teachable and humble. And that's what it says there. Be like-minded with lowliness of mind. Having this mind in you, make yourself of no reputation. Don't try to make yourself be gloried by men. Don't try to have yourself lifted up and celebrated by men. Matthew chapter 23, that's exactly what the scribes and Pharisees did. And they should have minded the greater truths, which is humbleness, which is meekness, which is a servant spirit, which is what God's showing us here. Have humble obedience, humble obedience. So what is real Christianity? Love for God's people. Having the unction of the spirit that when he speaks, you change, you reflect form. You are benefited by it and re, re, things get resolved in your hearts and you start to do the opposite of what you've done before. And now here in Philippians, humble obedience is what is seen as what is a mark of the Christian. Verse 15 of that same chapter, Philippians 2, it says that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. What's he saying here? He's like, if you want to be blameless, if you want to be harmless, if you want people to look at you and say, you are the son of God, you, you are without rebuke, you are, you are somebody that has the marks of the king of glory upon you, then you need to be these things. Have love for God's people, have that unction of the spirit, have humble obedience and shine as lights in this world. Make a difference in the world around you. When, when we are hypocritical, we don't benefit anybody around us, do we? we? We try to benefit ourselves. We try to find glory for ourselves. We lift ourselves up. We get applause and accolades for ourselves. But we are not a light shining in this world. We're, we're darkness rather than, than light in this world when we are full of ourselves. God wants us to, through our obedient hearts, be corrected and rebuked by the Spirit and love others even as Christ hath loved us. Of course, we don't have love for everybody that's out there. But the mark of a Christian very clearly in the scriptures was revealed that there is a love for the brethren. There is a love for the people that are congregated in this room. We have fellowship one with another because of our common father. If you want to be the sons of God without rebuke, blameless and harmless, in the midst of this crooked and perverse generation, don't be a hypocrite. Don't be a scribe. Don't be a Pharisee. Don't make yourself crisp and clean. You know what? Sometimes it's good to be honest. If somebody comes into church and people are like, hey, how are you doing, man? And you kind of see it on them. <laughs> their, their, their eyes are kind of sag and they look a little tired. But you see these people and they come and they're like, I'm great. But they just look like they got into a fight. <laughs> right? You know what? Sometimes it's good good for us to just be humble and just just have have an opportunity there for another believer to minister in you and be like man last night I was up all night with the kid they were sick I I I I, I haven't prayed for a couple days like it, things are rough and just be honest one with another because you know what that is that's the opposite of the Pharisee that puts on his his wonderful coat comes in and looks and appears good and righteous and and holy to everybody else he's putting on a show but as believers we should be a little tender we should we should allow others to come into our lives and to and to give them an opportunity to minister unto us that way we are given giving somebody an opportunity to be a blessing unto you and we're opening up our hearts to be blessed ourselves. That's the Christian life. That's the Christian walk. It's something that is contrary to this world, isn't it? Isn't it contrary to this world to just 
love other people and care about other people and put other people first. This world, and I was taught my whole life, you, 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 if you're going to get anything, it's going to be because you worked hard, you strived, you studied, you did this. No, if you're going to get anywhere, it's because... According to the Bible, you put others first and God lifts you up, doesn't he? You exalt others and he lifts you up. You humble yourselves, lift everybody else up, encourage everybody else, and allow for God to do the same unto you. Our world says that, hey, I, I, you need to know it all. You need, you need to establish your thoughts and be, be strong in your opinion. I know that in, in, in America, you cross over and you've, you've got the donkeys and the elephant people and everybody's got their opinion, right? And they got to stick to that, right? You got you to have a conviction of that and which side are you on? And you have to, you have to be able to stand b- behind your guns and stick to it. But the teachable spirit kind of just sits in the middle and goes, you know what? I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm here trying to learn. I'm trying to be corrected. This this is the walk that the Christian does. We don't need to be so firm in our, our, our own self. We can be teachable by the Spirit. Humble obedience, lifting up others, putting yourself down so that when God corrects you, you're not saying, well, who do you think you're talking to? When the preacher stands up and he gives you a word from God and it nails you between the eyes, you can't say, well, who does he think he is? I know what he does with his time. <laughs> you know what I mean? You need to be able to be humble and obey. Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus just trust and obey. And if you do all these things, and there's many more, and good thing God wrote a book. You can go home and check it out for yourself. <clears throat> Otherwise, I'd be up here all day, right? And many, many, many more days. If you do all these things, you will be a light of this world. You will be seen as different. You will be, you will be looked upon, and people will be like, there's something about that guy. You might even have somebody come up to you and say, what must I do to be saved? It's happened. I've had it happen once, right? People see your life and they're like, what in the world is different about you? And then you're like, well, let me show you, right? Here's a gospel tract. I have Jesus in my life. He saved my soul. And once he saved my soul, he opened up a whole book of knowledge and wonders and truths that allowed me to humbly obey them, allowed his spirit to give me power and unction to follow after what was written, and allowed me to love as I should and as I ought to. And that's what the message here is. Don't be a hypocrite. Be a real Christian. Amen. Thank you, Father, for this day, Lord, and for the word that you've given us. Uh, It helped me a lot.